Hello, Trinity Church. Today, as you can tell, I'm preaching by way of video because Dr. Robin and I are ministering this weekend in our church in Tacoma, Washington. I won't always do this, but I have a message on my heart in the middle of July that I just had to give you today. I, I feel this in my heart. So here I am on video, but I trust you can feel the Spirit of God and also know that my heart is with you, even though we are far apart geographically right now. Many years ago, on the very first Sunday I preached as your new pastor, I made mention of two qualities that we would make our characteristics in the future as a church. First, I said, we go one, we go all. And I believe that has been true of us as a church. We've never thrown someone out. Now, people have left us because they were mad. That's fine. Others, you know, we sent out to help our young leaders start new churches. But we've done everything in our power to never step on someone to reach someone else for Christ. We're in this thing together. And by the grace of God, we go one, we go all. The second thing I said is we're going to win. That's right. You can curse us, step on us, spit on us if you want to. But at the end of the day, we'll still be building up the temple of the Lord. That's who we are. That's what we do. And we're going to win. We didn't come to lose. We came to win. Hallelujah. Today, I want to remind you, Trinity Church, why we as a church have won, are winning, and if we choose to, we'll keep on winning. Today, I've titled my message, More With Less. Look at this passage of scripture with me, if you will. It's found in Matthew chapter 9, verses 35 through 38. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. You know, as I was researching this past week, I found that the average church size in America is 75 people, and the age of that church is 73 years old. Now, we were founded in 1960, so we're not quite 73 yet. In other words, it's taken the average church in America 73 years to get 75 people in church each Sunday. In January 2023, The Guardian reported that churches are closing at rapid numbers in the United States. Researchers say as congregations dwindle across the country and the younger generation of Americans abandon Christianity altogether, even as faith continues to dominate American politics. They reported that 4,500 churches closed in 2019 and only 3,000 churches were planted in 2019. These are the latest statistics that I could find. My question is, how is it that in a country where the church as a whole seems to be losing, how is it that we, Trinity Church, are still winning? How is it that this inner city church in Miami Gardens, Florida, keeps planning churches and can have 
14,500 folks in church on Easter Sunday as a corporate group. How have we maintained our diversity and joy and evangelism in such discouraging times? How do we keep winning? Whenever I ask the Lord that question, he always says to me, because you've been willing to do more with less. I know some of you this morning are asking the question, well, pastor, what does that mean that we do more with less? Let me show you what I mean by that. First, we dream more with less sleep. I'm going to say it again. We dream more with less sleep. I call this the can-do mentality. It's a hard work mentality. It's a willingness to run from a life of comfort and ease. It's that mentality that says, I'll run to the battle for my Lord because I cannot sleep while my friends are going to hell. I can't do it. Here's what Jesus said in John 9 and 4. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. Do you remember the night that Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane and he had asked his disciples to just pray with him for one hour? We know that very soon Judas would bring the angry authorities to take Jesus away for crucifixion. But he just wanted his disciples to pray with him. The Bible says Jesus went a little further beyond them to pray. While praying, he got up to check on his disciples, and they were all fast asleep. Here we are, moments away from the biggest sacrifice in the history of mankind, and these men who Jesus had given purpose to, had fallen asleep. Let me make it very clear, church. Dreams and visions usually don't come to you while you're sleeping. Purpose for living and dreams and visions that keep you moving forward usually arrive in your awake hours when you can see the problem and hear talk of the problem and hear God speak to your heart and mind the answer to the problem. Jesus never got his dreams and visions while sleeping. He got them while he was wide awake in the heat of the battle. Oftentimes the Lord will wake me up in the middle of the night to speak to me. I go downstairs and I hear his voice. God's dream for you, God's vision for you will come in the heat of the battle. You're facing a dilemma. You're in the heat of the battle. That's when he'll come to you with your eyes wide open. Jesus got up from the place of prayer and went to his disciples Listen to the sorrow in his words in Matthew chapter 26, 40 and 41. Then he returned to his disciples, scripture says, and found them sleeping. Couldn't you men keep watch with me for one hour, he asked Peter. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Wow, our people here at Trinity Church, especially our servant leaders, dream more with less sleep. I've learned that to be true. I'm grateful to God for a hard-working church. One of the things I'm always reminded of is my age. Sheesh. I remember as a young man thinking about certain aged leaders and wondering why they didn't step aside. 
Now, I'm reminded of that all the time, but when I think of that, I also think, Lord, you've given me a great amount of health and strength and vision. What should I do next? And I always hear him say, keep working. Keep going. Don't quit. Don't be lazy. Work your guts out, Rich. Now, so you don't get worried, I'll step aside soon enough. I promise you that. But while I'm here, I want to work for the night is coming when no one can work. I don't work in my sleep. I'm unconscious for at least seven or eight hours a day. The other 16, I've got to get to it. The problem that often comes when we work is we sometimes fail to rest and celebrate our wins because all we ever do is win, win, win. But you can't win, win, win when you're not in the game. I was sitting with Karen Johnson, who leads our creative ministries several months back, and she's an amazing leader. We had just finished last year's Scrooge presentation. Everybody was tired and excited and happy. And she just said, Pastor, what next? I said, Karen, we have to work harder than we've ever worked this coming year. The church will only grow when they see our vision and our passion for that vision. I said, I'd like to rest. And I know you would too. But I said, I just can't rest till I get to heaven. See, the vision for the future will only come to us as we're working while we're awake. Karen said, I'm ready. Let's do this. And that's what we're doing. That's our whole team. <laughs> that's the way pastors David and Linda Freeman are. That's our social service team. That's Dr. Kathy Hardcastle and our kids ministry team. Uh, school and church ministries. Pastor Mitch just started a brand new class for seniors on Sundays at 9.30 in the Legacy Suite. Two weeks ago he started. That's our youth ministry team with Dante and Savannah and Jason. That's our Tuesdays at Trinity team. That's our storehouse ministries team with Jorge and Winston and Grace. What great workers. And I could go on and on. I was driving home the other day from a meeting Dr. Rob and I had on South Beach. And as I came across the 395 towards I-95, I saw the beautiful Frost Museum on the south side of the freeway. And I thought to myself, that's one of our partners here at Peacemakers Family Service Center Trinity Church. How do you think we're dissecting sharks in our summer program? Because Pastor Linda thinks she's still 27 years old and works for the night is coming while she's working on her PhD at St. Thomas University. She's meeting with key leaders in this county and opening doors that no man can shut because she works for Jesus and Jesus gives her vision while she's awake and not sleeping. We sleep less, but dream more. That's the mark of a winning church. Thank God for Trinity. Another mark of a winning church is we create more with less tools. I'll call that a make-do mentality. Look at Scripture with me. 1 Samuel 13, verses 19 through 22 says, Not a blacksmith could be found in the whole land of Israel. Because the Philistines had said otherwise, the Hebrews will make swords or spears. So all Israel went down to the Philistines to have their plow points, mattocks, axes, and sickles sharpened. The price was 
two-thirds of a shekel for sharpening plow points and mattocks and a third of a shekel for sharpening forks and axes and for repointing goads. So on the day of the battle, not a soldier with Saul and Jonathan had a sword or spear in his hand. Only Saul and his son Jonathan had them. Here Israel found herself in one of the most outnumbered situations she had ever been involved in. The Philistines outnumbered Israel so entirely that Saul could only muster an army of 600 men. There was absolutely no hope whatsoever. But nobody told Jonathan that. He was the king's son. He said to his armor bearer, I love this in 1 Samuel 14 and verse 6, come, let's go over to the outpost of those uncircumcised men. Perhaps the Lord will act in our behalf. Nothing can hinder the Lord from saving, whether by many or by few. Man, I love Jonathan's resolve. Now remember, the tiny army of Israel, which was with Jonathan and his armor bearer at the time, they did not have conventional armor for battle. What they had was plow points and pitchforks and farming goads. But they had a variable that the Philistines could not match. And his name was Jehovah Jireh. Hallelujah. And friend, when God is on your side, it doesn't matter the quality of your business machinery. No. God is with you. And the Bible says that Jonathan and his armor bearer immediately killed 20 enemy soldiers. The Bible says, well, let's read it together. In 1 Samuel chapter 14 and verse 15, then panic struck the whole army, those in the camp and field and those in the outposts and raiding parties, and the ground shook. It was a panic sent by God. Hallelujah. I know that we're an inner city church. I know we've always been little David, Trinity Church, fighting the giant Goliath in this county now for so many years. But the truth is, David never had conventional weapons with which to bring down the giant either. All he had was a slingshot and five smooth stones. But he knew how to make do with what he had. He could create more with less conventional weapons. That's what we do here at Trinity Church. Always fixing old stuff. I go to some churches. They've got the best of the best. And I think, wow, if we had that, we could really be great. And then I hear the Lord say, But, Rich, if you had that, maybe you'd be less dependent on me. You'd depend on the fineries of life, the high-end tools of the work you're involved in. And that's when I stop sometimes and I just bow my head and I just start to sing that old song. Through it all, through it all, I've learned to trust in Jesus. I've learned to trust in God. Through it all, through it all, I've learned to depend upon his word. And so our teams and all of our folks here at Trinity, 
We suck it up when we don't have the best of the best technology because we know that our God is with us. We know that he will see us through and he always sees us through church. When it seems impossible, we raise our slingshots and we say with faith in our hearts, you come to us with a sword and a spear, but we come to you in the name of the God of all creation whom thou hast defied. Today, as in every day, you big devil, you lose and we win again by the power of our great God. Church, if you believe it, shout hallelujah right now. Hallelujah. And those giants just keep falling all around us. They've been falling for years. We create more with less tools here at Trinity Church. We make do. We are God's make-do people. Last of all, the thing that makes a winning church is we give more with less means. That is what I call a will-do church. So we've got a can-do, make-do, and a will-do mentality here at Trinity. This church through the years has not grown because we have so many mega millionaires in our church. Instead, we've grown because our DNA has always been, we will give more with less means. Look at this familiar passage, passage of scripture. I've, I've preached from this passage many times through the years, but I want us to look at it again. Mark chapter 12, verse 41 through 44. The Bible says Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts, but a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth only a few cents. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They all gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything. All she had to live on. Now, let me say very quickly, we have several, not many, but several folks in our church who not only do very well financially, but they also give largely to the work of the Lord here at Trinity Church. And I'm so, so grateful for them. I want that to be very, very clear. But I also want to say that this church has gone forward over the years with the generosity of the will-do mentality of poor widows and single mothers and single women who work their fingers to the bone and then give extravagantly to the Lord. I can't tell you how many times through the years I've watched after tithes and offerings were received at the end of the service, a second offering appeal has been given for a guest speaker or a missionary of some kind uh, or for some tragedy that took place somewhere in the world this week. And I will watch little ladies and college students reach into their pockets or wallets or cell phones and give again and again and again. Some of these folks are living on a small pension, and that means $10 means something. But for the people of Trinity, that 5 or $10 is dead to them if there is a need to be met. I know for some of them, it will mean miss, missing a meal or maybe baby diapers for the little one. I'm going I'm to ask Karen to just bring our worship team back up. Through the years, I've watched as parking lot attendants, 
choir members, drama team members, after serving all day in the house of the Lord, will come to me with an envelope carrying their tithe or an offering. And they'll say, hey, pastor, can you get this to one of the host team for me? Several months back after the second service, I had a single mom come to me in the lobby. I remember it like it was yesterday. I knew she was a nurse. She's a very faithful to this house here at Trinity. And she stopped me by the cafe and said, Pastor, can I speak to you for a minute? I said, of course. And she was very quiet. She put a bulging envelope of money into my hands. I said, what is this? She said, well, I tithe and give offerings, but this represents all of my overtime for last year. I made a pledge to the Lord that if he would meet my needs, I would give all of it to the Lord. The next day, the ladies in our account counting department called me and said, Pastor, you know that sack of cash you gave us? I said, yeah. There was $10,000 in that envelope. Church, I was shocked. And I sat behind my desk and I wept. And I prayed to the Lord. I said, thank you, Lord Jesus, for letting me come to Trinity Church in Miami. Thank you, Lord, that Robin and I could raise our four sons among such a loving, caring, generous group of people. Now, I'm going to ask Karen to bring our worship team out. Now, I want them to sing that last verse that says, if I never had a problem, I'd never know that God could solve them. I'd never know what faith in his word could do through it all. After they lead us, I'm going to ask Pastor David Freeman to come and lead us in prayer. Before Karen leads us in song, I want to remind you, church, we're winning these many years, and we will continue to win here in the dead of summer because we are a can-do church. We are a make-do church. And we are a will-do church mentality. Nothing is going to stop us when Jesus is our King. Karen, God bless you. And I thank Him for the mountains and I thank
Wow. I love that song so much through it all. I used to sing that as a young man, but it has great meaning today. You know, when you've decided to be a man or woman of God who says, Lord, with your help, I will be a can-do person. Uh, I'll move forward into battle with my eyes wide open. I'll wait for the vision to come, not when I'm sleeping, while I'm awake. And then when you decide, I am a make-do person. I don't care if I have the top technological features at my hands. Whatever you put in my hand, Lord, I'll fight till you call me home. That's the make-do mentality. And then when you, no matter the level of your work and your income, you decide, I will do. I... Jesus is everything to me. Nothing else matters. I'm solely dependent on Jesus. When you come to that place of I will do, doesn't matter. I will do. I'm going to tell you something. God's got you. He'll never let you fall ever. The Bible says in Psalm 55, 22, cast your cares upon the Lord, for he will never let the righteous fall. I'm speaking from my heart. I'm speaking from my 70 years of experience following Jesus. And today, maybe you've been kind of floating in between those different decisions, but maybe today, Something I said just got a hold of you and in your heart you said, I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm going to be, can do, make do, will do. That's who I'm going to be. That's my mentality until Jesus calls me home. If that's you, I want you to pray with me right now. I'm going to say a line. I want you to say a line with me. Dear Jesus, I come to you today and I realize that as a part of Trinity Church, I can't just sit by anymore. I must be the person you have called me to be. Lord, I'm ready. To be can do. I'm ready to be make do. Jesus, I'm ready to be that will do mentality servant you want me to be. Today, Lord, you can have it all. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. You know, if you were serious when you prayed that prayer with me, I know sometimes you just repeat a prayer after me, but if you were serious, that number at the bottom of your screen is my personal cell number. And if you were serious about that prayer, I want you to dial on your smartphone my cell number. And then at the top, I just want you to write me these words. Pastor, I'm ready. And give me your name. Pastor, I'm ready. And give me your name. And then hit send. And I'll get it today. I'll get it today. And I'll get back to you today. I give you my word. I love you so much. Until next time, this is Pastor Rich Wilkerson reminding you to go with God.